let's talk about op amps. Now, I've always kind of felt like all op amps were pretty much alike and interchangeable. If one of my team members said, hey, Amelia, I need an op amp, I'd just reach into my big old barrel of op amps and pull out a handful. Here you go. Here's a couple blue ones and one of those with the extra pins. And oh, hey, look at that, a 741. Man, that's got to be a collector's item by now. But it turns out that all op amps are not alike. When you're making design decisions, you need to think about your constraints like power and cost and precision. And not only that, there are some newer types of op amps that bring some significant advantages to your design. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today, I've got Namruta Pandya from On Semiconductor, and we're going to get the lowdown on choosing the best op amp for your next design. Let's get started. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about op amps from On Semiconductor. Welcome, Namruta. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Okay, so we've all used op amps and comparators before, but give us a little overview first just to get started. For operational amplifiers, in general, operational amplifiers and comparators, I mean, these are both used for signal conditioning. So you could use them for feedback in closed loop configurations. You could use them for sensors and a whole wide applications. I mean, it's a basic building block. Comparators, again, similar thing. You know, signal conditioning basically is what they're used for. Okay, so say I need an op amp. There are about a billion choices out there. So where do I start? How do I pick what I should use? Well, so the kind of op amp that you would pick would be very much dependent on what application you're using it in. There are specific parameters that are important like gain bandwidth, quescent current, offset voltage, and the package that you're using, noise, slew rate. So again, in some applications, some are important and the others not so much. It just depends on what application you have. And we can talk a little bit about some of those parameters as well. But I think over in general, if you're looking for a highly accurate signal reading, then you'd go for a precision amplifier. Something a little more linear? Yeah, something a little bit more linear. Also, with each of these parameters, there are trade-offs. So like, for example, gain bandwidth, there's a trade-off with current, more the gain bandwidth. Typically, the current consumption goes up. Those are some of the things that you'd consider as far as, I mean, it's a very high-level description of how you'd pick an op amp, but those are some of the things that you'd consider while you're trying to look for the one that matches your application. Okay, let's start off with your garden variety general purpose op amps that we've all probably used since engineering school. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those, like you have the LM358s and the 324s, these do really well in a wide, wide variety of applications. They're good for that bit of amplification that's needed or for buffer circuits and stuff like that. And they are quite popular. Sure, I'm positive everyone has used a ton of these in all kinds of projects. So my question is, if that kind of op amp has worked for us for decades, why do we want something different? Well, so for one, it's an older process technology. They're using old bipolar processes. There are trade-offs between that and the newer CMOS process amplifiers that we get nowadays. There is lower current consumption. There are better precision technologies that's available on the CMOS process as well. So I guess with the way the environment is changing and the consumer demand is changing, you will need more accuracy. You would need lower power consumption. This is where it's important that you explore what the other choices are beyond the general purpose that is available. So you mentioned CMOS. How are the cool kids making amplifiers these days? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think more than designing it, I think this is just the trade-offs in terms of okay, understanding that when you're picking something, when you're picking a bipolar amplifier like the LM324s or 358s, or you're picking, I'm going to use on semiconductors NCS2000. Sure. 6.2 product as an example. And that's a CMOS amplifier, right? There are some basic trade-offs that you'd look at as far as performance is concerned. So let's pick power consumption. Okay. The trade-off with the power consumption is that as the gain bandwidth goes up, the power consumption also goes up, 
with the way CMOS amplifiers are designed, it is consumed only when the circuit is activated. Again, this is very high level. It's just so that you understand what we are talking about. That versus when you're looking at the bipolar amplifiers, because it requires current to bias a transistor, it's always consuming current. Bipolar is imposing this power tax all of the time. Right. There is another advantage there. Because you have high voltage breakdown with the bipolar transistors, you're able to use them for higher voltage applications because they're capable of going much higher in voltage and supply as well. On the other side, on the CMOS side, these are better suited for low voltage applications. So there is that little bit that, that you know you give up. The other one that I'd like to touch on is noise. So when you look at the way the CMOS amplifiers are designed, a lot of the current flows close to the surface. Because of that, it is susceptible to a lot of the external noise and the various noise elements that are available. 1 over F noise is generally higher in CMOS amplifiers as well. When you look at the bipolar side, because it is like an NPN or a PNP transistor, this noise is very well buried deeper and which is why you'd see that the noise performance is much better. They have better high frequency characteristics as well. So that is where, again, you know, your trade-off comes in, where, okay, well, do I need better noise? Is my amplifier going to be in a noisy environment, or is it going to be more in, in a place where it's, you know, I'm very sensitive, my application is a sensitive to noise or not? And that would be one consideration that you'd have. Got it. Makes sense. And then the offset voltage. Now, in this, we're talking older bipolar amplifiers specifically because newer bipolar amplifiers, the process has been able to develop and get advanced to a point where you can now also implement accurate solutions on there. But let's talk about the older bipolar amplifiers when we're comparing offset voltage. Okay. So for offset voltage in general, I mean, with CMOS amplifiers, you're able to get better transistor matching. That, as well as being able to implement digital offset calibration techniques on there allows us to get offset as low as in the 8 or 10 microvolts range. Oh, wow. Essentially, what's happening is your offset voltage is manifesting itself as an error at the output. And lower that offset, higher the accuracy of the signal that you're going to be measuring. Makes sense. Right? On the other side, bipolar amplifiers, the older ones, are known for the analog signal capabilities. So if you are trying to even implement any of the exotic techniques, it's very expensive to do so. So the whole point of having an LM324, which is generally cheaper than the CMOS amplifiers, you would then, trying to put a trimming methodology on top of that, would just move the whole point of leveraging an old part for its cost purposes. And then lastly, bias current. Now, this one is a big one when it comes to bipolar. The leakages are in the nanoamperes range when it comes to bipolar amplifiers. For CMOS, it is in the picoamps. It's really low. A lot of this has got to do with the basic process, the transistor design itself. Sure. And they require very low input current. As a result, the leakage is low as well. And that plays again into the power savings, right? Mm -hmm. More accuracy than power savings. Power savings, yes, but more the accuracy because leakage, bias current or leakage, any of the leakages then manifest themselves again as error. All right. So on the power topic, let's say my application is power constrained. What are the things we need to think about there? If the application is power constrained, in the sense if you're using it to improve the battery life, it would be the power consumption, the quescent current. Like, for example, you know, I mentioned the NCS20062, and here we've got the 20082 and 92. And this is 42 microamps per channel. So these are really, really an improvement compared to the traditional bipolar amplifiers of the LM358s that we've seen, which is a 350 microamps, the same gain bandwidth. Wow, that's very low. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Sometimes on Chalk Talks, I get a little loud and they complain that I am clipping or at least hitting the rails. So let's talk about rails and amplifiers and what rail to rail is all about. <laughs> I not exactly the same. Yes and no, but for real to real it's got to do with distortion. It's important to see that, okay, what kind of an input signal do you have and how close to the rail you can get, either on the input or the output. Okay. Right? And so looking at the input side, it's a common mode range is closer to the rail, you're getting a wider dynamic range. On the output side, typically if there is no rail to rail out, you can only get within a few hundred millivolts of the rail versus if it's a rail to rail out op amp, it goes wider within 
tens of millivolts. So you're getting a wider swing and it's not going to clip. Okay, so I think I get the rail-to-rail amplifiers conceptually. So what rail-to-rail amplifiers have you got for me? So for rail-to-rail amplifiers, both for amplifiers as well as comparators, we do have a very strong offering. Some of the recent devices that we have released include the NCS2005, the NCS20689, in the comparators, the NCS2200. The newer op amp that we've released, the latest one, is the NCS333, which is a zero drift amplifier. Okay, sure. Tell me more about zero drift. So zero drift amplifiers, basically, we talked a little bit about it on the earlier portion. We're talking about digital trimming methodologies. Zero drift would be one of those where it's not digital, but it is one of those calibration techniques that you can implement on a CMOS amplifier easily. It basically helps keep the offset voltage as well as the offset drift low over time and temperature. It's very ideal when you're measuring small currents, sensor currents, when you're doing low side current sensing. These devices actually do phenomenally well. And you can see, like, for example, the NCS2333, which is the dual of the part that I mentioned on the earlier slide, it's a 30 microvolt offset with a 0.07 microvolts per degree C drift. So not only do you keep that level of accuracy at the initial start, but you also are able to keep that level of accuracy as the application operates over time or if there is variances in temperature. Okay, have you got any examples we can talk about to show me how this might look in my design? Yeah, so let's talk about low side current sensing. So you have a load and you're going to measure the current that's going through the load on the lower side, so between the load and the ground. There is a sense resistor, which is put across the input terminals of the op amp. Yep. And the op amp interfaces with the ADC and the microcontrol. So a standard signal chain, a block diagram that we're looking at. Now in this, what happens is when the current is small, it's basically measuring how much current is going through that sense resistor. And small changes, depending on the application, if smaller the change, that means your offset voltage needs to be small as well. Think about it this way. You've got a small change that's taking place, but if you have an op amp with a very high offset on it, the small current with the high offset, you could lose the accuracy once it gets amplified on the other side of the amp. That makes sense. Right? In addition to that, you also have the resistors R1, R2, R3, and R4. They need to be very well matched. If they're not matched, they're adding to that offset as well. In general, This is one application that does require precision. Okay. Right? Depending on, say, if you're measuring small currents, you do. And so for places like power supply applications, a lot of the automotive battery management kind of applications, this is where we're seeing that they are using the sense resistor with the amplifier as well. And we need to minimize that offset as small as possible. You cannot get rid of it, but you can keep it as low as possible. So that is where this is critical. And to give you an example, let's do a compare and contrast between the LM321, the NCS 2071, which is a CMOS amplifier with no calibration techniques on it. Okay. Then you have the NCS21911. It's a zero drift amplifier as well. Then you have the NCS214R, which is a current sense amplifier. So the resistors that I mentioned earlier that were external, we have pulled it in and made it an integrated part as well. So the op amp and the gain setting resistors are all on one chip. So I don't have to worry about precision matching my resistors. Correct. And in addition to that, it's space savings. These highly matched resistors can get expensive. Yep. So you're saving bomb cost as well as you're saving the headache of having to deal with those external resistors. What we're looking at right now, we're doing a comparison on, okay, if you're using a 50 millivolt shunt drop, you can see the difference just because of the offset voltage. The offset voltage for the LM321 is 7 millivolts. And let's just take the first three up to 21911, where the offset goes down to 25 microvolts, right? The change in the offset error is significant. Yes. Right? The last block is the NCS214R. Again, the offset error is much lower, in addition to also getting your bomb cost saving and better matched resistors. Fully integrated solution. Fully integrated solution. So your system performance in general improves. Now, if you know that, okay, I'm I'm only tolerant to 2% offset error, right? Then in that case, again, you're seeing that your shunt drop is also changing quite a bit. Now, why is that important? Because when you have a reduced sense resistor voltage drop, 
your power dissipation across that is going to be less. So it's a smaller sense resistor that you need. Smaller sense resistor means it's of course cheaper, but also that their efficiency is also improving. So there are advantages to each one of these. Now, if you're just using something that's going to turn on and off, yes, an LM321 is a good choice. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's not a bad one. There is a home for it, but it's about picking the correct amplifier for your application. So this is where you do the compare and contrast on what is it that your system requires and which one is appropriate for the use. Those are some dramatic improvements. So give me some comparison between my old school op amps and some of these new ones. So let's look at the LM358 and compare it with the NCS20072 and the 20082. What you're looking at right now are three devices that have three different gain bandwidth products. With the change of the gain bandwidth, the Quesson current is going to change. So I'm going to compare the LM358 right now with the NCS20082. Okay. There is a significant advantage in the Quesson current, as you can see. Now, if you are going to, for a minute, not look at the gain bandwidth versus the Quesson current for the NCS20072, you can see that the LM358 has a was over temperature of 9 millivolt versus that of a 4.5 millivolt or a 4 millivolt of the other CMOS devices. Both of them do not have any calibration techniques on it. But this is just one start on, okay, where you're going to get something a little bit better that you need that next level of performance, but really not want to pay an arm and a leg for the precision device. And this would be another choice that you'd make. All right. So let's say I want to take advantage of some of this new cool stuff and my application needs that extra boost. How do I migrate to what I'm using today? So we do have a migration path that is available. You know, when you look at the LM321 and compare that again with the NCS20071 or the Zero Drift amplifier as the NCS21911, all of these are similar specs. Our set voltage is up to 32, 36 volts. Gain bandwidth is in that 1 to 3 megahertz range. You're getting an input offset voltage that can go all the way from 7 millivolts down to 25 microvolts. You're getting drift that is significantly better as well. CMRR, PSRR, all of these specs are critical in, in the current sensing application, for example, that I mentioned. These are all parameters that give you an idea or you can gauge the accuracy based on that. So these would be some of the choices you would have where you can migrate from one device to another, depending on what price point you're looking at or what performance you need as well. So I can select the amount of improvement or the amount of performance mm -hmm. based on my application demands and my bomb. Yeah. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. This was super cool. And I'm going to click that link and go to a mauser.com page for more information. Well, Namruta, thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. It was fun. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about op amps from On Semiconductor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal. <laughs>